going on guys it's mac here from cryptstar staking here for another wonderful olive zero update for you guys well actually today's video we're going to be covering another video on youtube that was uh touching on the olive zero liminal layer it was a speech done it was a keynote speech done by adam seagal and he's the co one of the co-founders of olive zero and he talks about the liminal layer and the sort of different colors or different variations of decentralized finance and private decentralized finance and like how privacy is going to become a very important part of the finance because as of right now, the, the whole exchange is very, uh, like basically the, all the transactions are very hidden and covered by the exchange themselves. And there's a lot of bots going on that can go ahead and read when orders are made on order books. And as soon as the order gets placed, then the bots react to it immediately because there's no, because they aren't privatized. But anyways, we're gonna be covering that in today's video. So if you're really interested, make sure you guys watch to the very end. And uh, yeah, go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. All of your support is greatly appreciated. And go ahead and follow me on Twitter if you want, um, Quipstar Mac. Uh, you can see the link down in the description to the video below. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right into today's video. So here we go, Etdam 2023. This was uh, uploaded by Crypto Canal. And yes, it's on, a, it's a keynote speech exploring the flavors of private decentralized exchanges by Adam Segal. Adam from Aleph Zero, and we go. I'm Skip gonna ahead. talk <laughs> about um, private DEXs. First, I'm gonna introduce the challenge that's there and provide some background on, on definitions, then do a very, very quick uh, overview of uh, current approaches, and I'll finalize with our own take on, on private order book. So first, uh, like conceptual definitions here. Uh, so there is a difference between anonymity, privacy, and pseudonymity. Pseudonymity is basically what we kind of have as given in most of the blockchains. It means that we don't usually write our own name there. We rather have addresses which are serving as, our, as uh, pseudonyms. So of course, it, this is how it works on Bitcoin, this is how it works on Ethereum, and most other chains. Uh, so whenever there is a... So you guys can see pseudonymity, anonymity, and privacy. So pseudonymity means that uh, yeah, it's the, the, the one address sends to another address. You can see the whole transaction. But with anonymity, it's someone sends to someone. So you don't know the name, you don't know the address, and you don't know the receiving address or name as well. On chain transaction, we see just that some, some tokens have been sent from one address to another. And of course, there is the entire business uh, around tracking these addresses and assigning to, to individuals. Then there is the next step, which is called anonymity. And then if we have anonymous uh, protocols, for example, shielded transactions on Zcash, um, Tornado Cash Nova, um, Rail Railgun, or US, then what, what is seen on chain is um, either what happens, let's not, not all, sometimes this is uh, concealed, but let's say that uh, it is seen what action is, uh, is being done, it is not seen who, who initiates the action. And there are various flavors here. Sometimes the value is also uh, also concealed. Sometimes the type of token is also concealed. Um, but this works mostly for user-to-user -user interaction. And privacy is uh, basically concealing everything. So the only thing that is visible on chain is that something happened. No one knows what happened. So how usually uh, the solutions are built is that they are using something that we call shielder primitive. And the name originates from, from shielding transactions on Zcash. And this is basically the same thing that, that multiple projects right now are implementing. Uh, so if we have uh, like this graph of, of value transfers, where Alice is sending some tokens to Edgar, which is sending some tokens to Frank, and so on and so on, they can use different addresses, but still these transfers are trackable. Then we may have like this specific, special, special box here where some transfers are happening inside, but there is some cryptographic magic that I'm not gonna uh, explore during this talk, which allows uh, these things to be concealed. So what's seen for the outside observer is that, well, some tokens have been deposited to this crypto magical thing, crypto magical world, and then something happens inside maybe, and some tokens went out of it. So it's a very big privacy pool uh, and from the, for the outside world, it's actually seen as a one super user. So, so um, 
tokens of all the users which are using this, this primitive are, are mixed together. Uh, we have our own instantiation of this is called Shielder. Uh, and one of the interesting things that can be done with the Shielder, not only ours, also for example, Railgun is, is working on a very similar solution, is it is possible to initiate a smart contract interaction from inside of the Shielder. So then how it looks like is that we have a normal mm, transparent public decentralized exchange. It may be a fork of Uniswap or actually the original Uniswap. Uh, so we initiate the transactions from, from inside of the Shielder. So, so it's, it goes out of the Shielder so everyone can see that from the Shielder, the transaction for, for example, one Ether have been initiated. It has been changed on the DEX for, let's say, uh, 1,800 DAI, and then it goes back to the Shielder. So that's the, the information that the entire world sees. What's not seen here is who actually initiated this action. So there are more. So another way to put this is basically this is the, this would, instead of saying that someone's name, it would say the Shielder's name. And so everything is happening inside of the Shielder being, uh, we call it unencrypted and encrypted between the users. But then inside of the Shielder, uh, you would you would never know uh, what happens. It would just say, yeah, someone or whatever. Multiple users of the Shielder and they are effectively mixed together. Mm. So this gives us anonymous exchanges. So uh, as mm, I'm referring to the slide before, uh, it's not private because everyone sees what actually happened. Uh, no one sees who initiated it. So no one sees uh, who, uh, who was the trader. Um, and once again, this is just a regular DEX. It doesn't need to be like privacy enhancing DEX or anything like that. Shielder is already privacy enhancing enough to, to be able to, to integrate with, with normal DeFi. So right now, the challenge that we're, uh, that we're tackling is, uh, is concealing this thing. So what happens? Uh, here it's not private and it's actually it would be nice to, to have it private especially in case of order books because oftentimes when uh, the order comes to the exchange and is published it uh, cr causes a market to react even before it is starting to get filled. So what he's talking about here is whale manipulation when it comes to market prices so if you can actually have the shielder right here as well and the shielder right here covering both the transaction and the people inside of it that would prevent whales from being able to manipulate the market with large order book orders and uh yeah like oh i'm gonna protect the price by this amount uh because i have a huge order right here or maybe you know and then the other people see that and the bots see that and then they react to it and it causes a market reaction based on just one big order that might not might or might not go through and it's basically just whale manipulation this is kind of the core essence of whale manipulation so what we're trying to do is to create such an order book where anyone can put the order but without causing market to react in starting. Mm, and it prevents order from shining and, and things like that. So mostly these are economical uh, positive consequences of, of concealing this, as anonymity is something that we had anyway. There are two flavors of, uh, of doing this right now. So the first one, which is perhaps more straightforward, is peer-to-peer. -peer. So these are protocols such as, for example, Renegade Finance. Mm, and they are based on the idea that the trader, which is uh, trying to swap, exchange some tokens, he's uh, connecting to other uh, potential, potential traders and running some kind of a private protocol to see whether they are a match in the sense that they can trade with each other. So they initiate like cryptographic Tinder-like interaction where like if they are willing to trade opposite uh, sides of a pair, then they get informed about it and they actually initiate this private private swap and if they if they do anything else did he just say tinder like interaction i think i don't know if he said that but I, yeah, basically it's just private uh, two private counterparties being able to uh transact with try uh, do transactions with each other through the the shielded the shielded layer they they don't doesn't learn anything about their intents they, they just well they just see that there is no match so it's good because it's full privacy, at least in theory. I'm gonna say uh, a sentence about it in a moment. But it's slow and expensive. So basically, user who wants to trade anything needs to be constantly online and constantly connect to these other peers searching for, for the matches for this particular trade. Uh, 
So what actually happens in most of the protocols, and specifically in the in the Renegade, is that these traders are uh, are having relayers which act on their behalf. So so there are specific parties called relayers, and the trader needs to reveal all their intentions to the relayers. So here we are sacrificing some privacy because this relayer network they do have information about all the orders, uh, but well the user experience is. Uh, unmeasurably better because user doesn't need to stay online at all, at all times. Uh, so it's kind of adjustable level of privacy, uh, but the protocol in any case is pretty slow. And there is another way, which is, uh, let's say, aggregated reveal way. And the idea here is that we are having the orders encrypted, but then we are creating batches of this order and we are decrypting the entire batch. So this is uh, connected to the concept of dif differential privacy in a way. So the individual order or individual intent of a single user is never revealed. The only thing that is ever revealed is the aggregated intent of bigger group of, uh, of users. Mm. So it definitely offers better UX in the sense that user needs to do just one action uh, generate some cryptographic thing on chain and this, then this thing will be processed by, by the system. It's much faster and it scales much better because in the peer-to-peer -peer network, the more peers, the longer you, you'll need to wait for, for your trade counterparty. This, this, uh, this approach doesn't have this problem. Mm. It has limited privacy in the sense that, well, yes, it does reveal the entire batches. It can be some improved by, by, by some heuristics. For example, it's uh, possible and pretty cheap to, to just uh, put fake empty requests uh, into the order book. So the actual order book is made up of mostly empty requests and just few non-empty ones. So when the, each of the aggregates is pretty big with only few actual users. Uh, but well, anyway. It's so basically what he's saying here is, this is probably the best idea, aggregated reveals, which means like say 10 people go ahead and place an order, then all their combined totals of how much they're trading and the total amount of transactions and everything is sort of mixed up and there's no way to do it. But then you still know that there is a lot, uh, that there's 10 users that did this much stuff. But what he's saying is once you put in uh, fake user requests into that order, then it'll be like 100 users did this many transactions instead of the 10 users, which would sort of increase the... I guess, uh, yeah, it would increase the privacy of it, but it still wouldn't be, you know, 100% private. But it's probably the best, kind of the best solution out of the other two that we were going through. Definitely, privacy is more limited than in peer-to-peer. -peer, this perfect, perfect model. It's good enough to to provide this economic benefit, though. So uh, the last uh, thing I want to show is our like our kind of architecture or the, the, the draft of our uh, architecture as the in, in fact system is a bit more complex than, than what's written here. So the idea here is that anyone who is keeping the tokens in the shielder in this cryptographic uh, black box can create order out of it. So if someone had some USDT in the shielder, uh, the user can freeze this USDT associated with the order. The order specifies the price at which it should be cleared, it, it has concealed value. So no one can see whether it's an empty order or very big order, nothing like this can, can be seen. So there is entire on-chain order book of, of such uh, value encrypted orders. And then the system proceeds as follows. There is a price oracle required. So uh, the system uh, queries the price from price oracle and basically chooses the orders which are kind of possible to be filled in the in the current market condition. So all of zero, they do have like a, a partnership with the Oracle company. I can't remember their name right now, but they do have a, a partnership with an Oracle company. Also, there's, you know, linked the price of Oracles and all sorts of price of Oracles you can use out there. But I know that uh, all of zero actually already has a uh, Oracle that they're they're working with directly. So, with, so they're creating this new common, which will be using the liminal shielder. And then that will go ahead and ping their partner, which is the price of Oracle. So the orders which are selling USDT at, uh, at a good enough price or buying it at also good enough price. So uh, these things, they are um, encrypted on chain. So this is homomorphic encryption and they are aggregated into, into one batch. So the one batch is like, uh, where were, let's say in this example, two orders. 
So they are aggregated into one request, which has just the sum of the values, and three requests from the other side are aggregated into one, where they also have just sum of the values. So if you remember the last part, you're going to have like 10 fake orders on top of this, which would make it much harder to go ahead and read the, really guess the individual value of each individual order if you have 10 fake orders in there, because they're all encrypted together. And yeah, it makes it look a little bit more kind of, yeah. It, yeah. Then this is the only thing which gets ever revealed in this system, which is a b aggregated batch. So now we see how many uh, tokens are meant to be traded one way and how many are meant to be traded the other way. Then there is, this is interesting economic optimization where actually doing in-batch trading, like inside trading is the best thing that can happen to users because this is outside of the, of the normal market, so no uh, front running can apply here. And users are exchanging tokens at perfect prices because they are, have, are, have been just matched to the counterparties. And the rest of this is just regularly traded and goes back into the shielder. So, uh, like, summing it up, uh, the, the entire flow is that the user puts a value encrypted request and just waits until it is traded. The request itself is never revealed. The only thing that is ever revealed is the entire batch into which the, the trade was aggregated. So, uh, and, well, the trick here, which, well, the, the privacy by, by, like, academic standards, it's not perfect, although it's technically pretty easy to actually obfuscate this order book by placing multiple empty orders at every every price which is close obfuscate. to the current that market. That was the way I was looking so for. Yeah. Like every batch will be actually filled with orders. Obfuscate where, or well, hide. Uh, unknown amount of them will be will be actual user we'll make orders. Make it less And obvious. it has this economic benefits of adding this privacy that, uh, that some of the orders are in batch, so they are just matched with uh, counterparties at perfect prices. Mm. So that's all for the talk. If anyone has any questions, I would be super happy to, uh, to address them. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no questions on Slido, but if there are any questions, please raise your hand. We go old school. Yeah, one in the back. Which one? Oh, there you go. Does Shielder have any compliance features? Does it have compliance features? That's a very good question. Uh, so right now <laughs> we're working on a zero knowledge ID system. So basically we are focusing very much on ID that is user controlled. So we will not have like a, any kind of master key where any third party can reveal anything. Uh, what we want to do is to allow users to produce proofs such of statements such as I never did a deposit from any of these addresses which are on uh, on chain, uh, let's say blacklist or sanctioned Oracle or things like that. So right now uh, the protocols for doing uh, non-inclusion proofs uh, like snark proofs are, are getting much better. So so this is the, the solution that we're uh, that we're. Uh, following rather than having this kind of master key. So I think what he's saying here is that he's looking, he's creating uh, tools for users to do, uh, self audit tools that you can go ahead and turn in. Uh, if you get audited or something, that you can go ahead and turn these into your, your government or whatever. So that way the government knows that you're being uh, regulatory compliant with your, with your uh, trades and everything is what I think he's saying here. So yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> cool. Um, so, you can put the order at any moment. And so I'll try and turn up the questions. They're really quiet, so I'll try and put the volume up on the questions. Just be careful with your ears. I'll try and fix it in the post, though. And like, there is a continuous process of, of batch aggregation. So, uh, like, there are just few predefined moments. Like, there is a moment where the batch is finished and then revealed, and then there will be there's actually um, economic mechanism of Dutch auction in, in clearing the, the batch. So it's, it's going for several blocks. 
We are um, layer one, so we have uh, very low block time, uh, one second. So in general, like the entire batch production can can fit into below 10 seconds uh, together with the auction. Uh, and it, like placing the orders into the order book can happen at any time. It's just like if you do it at the time the auction of the previous batch is proceeding, you're gonna wait like a few seconds more for, for the order to be. Uh... So what he's saying here is that whenever you put, uh, because of the aggregated uh, method that they're using to put in place orders, then you're gonna go ahead and uh, have to wait between one and 10 seconds, depending on if you, are, if you put your order in right after the last batch got pushed through, then you're gonna have to wait the full nine, 10 seconds. But if you do it at the end of the previous batch, then it'll get placed right away. To be included in the batch, but uh, like from the user perspective, you, you you don't need to care about when the uh, the batches are getting aggregated. Cool. Any more questions? This is the last chance. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, guys, well, I really hoped that helped you guys out. If you guys like this kind of video where I go out and try and find some hidden gem videos and show them on the channel, of course, I give credit to the, the YouTube person uh, who uploaded it in the beginning themselves. But I think it's just really useful to go ahead and you know spread the information that might not be have, have been spread very well uh, the first time or just because there was just wasn't enough reach to go ahead and spread it. Uh, anyways, if you like this video, make sure you guys give it a thumbs up. Let me know if there's any other videos that I should go ahead and feature on the channel and talk about. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Have an excellent day, guys.